is talk about the past, the present, and the future of finance. Because I think what's most interesting about the past is what it says to us about money today, where, where ultimately money is headed. Uh, Michael was referring to a company that I started about two years ago. It was originally called BitReserve. Today, it's, uh, it's part of a whole. We changed the name uh, when uh, we started allowing value to flow in in a different way. When the company was first started, you could only deposit Bitcoin. And about three or four months ago, we connected every U.S. bank, bank account. Uh, we connected every EU bank account, UK bank account. Uh, we just announced that we now connect every Chinese bank account to China Union Pay. Uh, we've announced that India is coming. And ultimately, the goal is not to just connect the blockchain and Bitcoin, but to connect every payment system and every financial system in the entire world. By allowing money to flow in and out easily or don't hold, the belief is the cloud money that we're creating will uh, ultimately, people will decide to leave money there because when it gets in a hold, you can transact instantly at no cost, no, no FX fees, <coughs> excuse me, and we hold the money completely transparently. So people know how we're always holding it. So there are, there are, I've, uh, since well before I started the company, I've been interested in money. It's actually a fascinating topic. I recommend two books. They're, they're actually, um, even, if you, even if you're not interested in money, the stories that they tell are, are entertaining enough to make the books uh, well worth the time. And if you're interested in money at all, they're utterly fascinating. And both of them come at it from a slightly different point of view. Um, but both of them are equally readable. They're not, they're not textbooks. They're really just telling the actual story of money. The, the thing is about money is that it, it is an innovation, a profound innovation on many, many different fronts. And it involved, obviously, a concept of mind. But in order for people to want gold, which is a representation of value, they had to not want food. So you needed to have a society that was sufficiently advanced that you could contemplate holding things other than being a hunter-gatherer and trying to fill the, the food requirement, the caloric requirement for the day. So, so if, if you wanted to uh, create a system that you know the early systems created gold and silver, you had to be able to mine these cores and you had to ultimately be able to strike them into something that represented and consistently represented currency. And so when this happened, it was like the internet, and it spread throughout the uh, Mediterranean you know, over about a 50-year period. And it was no less profound to the societies as the internet is today. In fact, it may have been more profound. The world was just, was just smaller. But it spread uh, incredibly fast for, for the time. There's there's this thing that, that I call the obvious problem, and it has to do with um, the fact that we all use money and we so take it for granted that we, we can't even contemplate the fact that it might ever have been a, an innovation of any type. It just seems so obvious that we would have money. Well, how, how could we have lived without any money? And, and I, uh, was, I was talking about <coughs> with somebody that when we were launching CNET, and, in February, April, well, I guess we, were, we launched it in April of 95. We, we asked ourselves a question that nobody had ever asked themselves before. All of the websites on the internet at the time, and there were only 300,000 people, they were all basically theses and papers and, and stuff related to you know, the academics and the military. So we were actually the second kind of commercial website out of, out of the one that's no longer existing called Hotwire. And so we said, well, you know, what should this logo do that's sitting at the top of the page? Because nobody really ever put one. And so we said, you know what? You should, as you move down into the website, you should be able to click it and go home from wherever you are. And so we put, if you can see here below the logo, we put the little word home so that you would know that if you click the logo, you'll go back to the home page. Now, if you go to any website today, you just take it for granted that you can click that and you can go home. It doesn't even seem like an innovation you know, worth spending any time on. But 
but in some ways, the fact that everybody uses it and so takes it, takes it for granted actually says that it was actually an important innovation. And this is what happens to things like money, which are actually, unlike this, enormous innovations that we just don't see as being, as being so anymore. It's only at times like these, when things are changing, that we start contemplating them, that we realize how important they actually were. So, when the company was called Bit Reserve, we, as I said, we only accepted Bitcoin, but we let you convert it into multiple forms of value. And that was so you could avoid the volatility of Bitcoin, which we all know, who follow Bitcoin, is a problem. And we did something really interesting, which is we launched gold, and gold gave you the ability to convert your Bitcoin instantly into gold, and to convert gold instantly into Bitcoin. And so, this was like this amazing idea. We were taking literally the oldest form of money and we were combining it with the newest form of money. And so I said to our marketing department, you know, this is, we're, we're literally taking old and new and, and, and sticking them together in an incredibly novel way. Let's do like a short little documentary that like talks about the history of money and how these things are all, have now become sort of uh, intertwined. So this is just a short, Oh, hold on a second. Is there audio for this? It is? It's up. Yes. It's up. Yes. Yes. We, right now, are on the precipice of an extraordinary transformation in technology. I honestly think this is probably the best moment that Bitcoin has had to be. If it has a better one, it's going to be a whole variety. So behind me over here is the British Museum. And inside of it is the world's first money. And it was made in the year roughly around 650 BC in the country of Lydia, which is modern day Turkey. We're about to begin an amazing adventure. We are going to use the world's newest and most innovative form of money to go back to the place where money was first born. This is a map of the ancient empire of Lydia where money is said to have originated. If we look at it on the map, we're here in London, about 1,600 miles away. So I picked a couple of flights at cheapair.com. They accept Bitcoin and a few other alt currencies. And now if I come down here and say I'd like to pay with Bitcoin, and let's go to Bit Reserve. I have some Bitcoin, I have some dollars, and down here I have our new gold money. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the money that I'm currently holding my dollar card, and I'm going to transfer that to my brand new gold card. Now you see I have roughly about half an ounce of gold that is actually sitting in a physical location in the vault. We're gonna go with my gold money, we're gonna send, and I'm gonna get the total amount of Bitcoin that I owe them, and now that's gone instantly. And I now hold a round trip ticket, buying with gold, converted to Bitcoin, to return to the very home of the innovation which started all of this off in the first place, the invention of money. It's amazing. This probably is the first time someone has actually bought a plane ticket with gold. It demonstrates the real power of Bitcoin. Now I'm just excited to go back to see where it all started. The most important characteristic is that gold reserves purchasing power for long periods of time. So for example, an ounce of gold today buys the same amount of crude oil it did in 1950. Today you can buy a man's suit for an ounce of gold, a Roman senator could buy his toga for an ounce of gold. What is it about this yellow metal that makes it so special? Well, the fact it's chemically inert, it resists oxidization, it's fungible. The gold in my ring is the same as the gold in Fort Knox. And these are things that Bitcoin does have in common with gold. One Bitcoin is identical to another Bitcoin. You can divide it up much like you can gold. Wow, that is amazing. So this is the form of gold that they deserve to be holding. How much does this weigh? It's about 25 pounds for this, 30, 30 pounds. I don't think right now it's very easy for people to hold gold as money, so I think this is innovative. Nobody runs very fast for these people. These are not made for sprinters. Yeah. <laughs> Gold's strength is that it's something corporeal. You can put it in your hand and feel it and touch it and carry it around with you. Cryptocurrency, on the other hand, its strength is that you can't pick it up in your hand. When you send gold, you have two choices. You can send this, 
or using BitReserve, you can store all this gold on your iPhone and it's still way exactly the same amount. I'm not going to bet against several thousand years of history and say that gold's going to be going out of fashion anytime soon. Yeah, I think the two are complementary, and I think ultimately the mix of gold and, and cryptocurrencies uh, is going to change the way we do global commerce. <laughs> And, and 
And so, I have another uh, company that started a little over a year ago. It's actually the leading VR app now, which is not saying much because it's a very small market. But it allows you to build your own, you build your own world. And we have about 400 objects that you can use, but we're going to launch a marketplace in, uh, in March where you can buy trees and guns and all kinds of other stuff. And to do that, we've launched our own digital currency called the Voxel. And using Uphold, I can now combine these two things so that you can use any bank account in the US, Europe, China, whatever, or any credit card to actually buy the Voxel. And there are about three exchanges that will be exchanging the Voxel. And so we have this in-game currency that's typically, there are always there have been lots of in-game currencies. It is why digital currency evolved. They evolved out of in-game currency. But now it's the first time it's an in-game currency that is a full currency and, and back at, at a whole, you can now exchange, you will be able to in March exchange this into any of the other 24 currencies or four metals. In fact, when we launch our, when we launch the, um, when we launch our debit card, you'll actually be able to hold all your value in voxels in the cloud and we'll just, so I, I think that we're, we're obviously seeing technology driving a bunch of fundamental changes, but in the end, money is such an important part of human culture, and it is such an important concept of the mind that the technologies, like Bitcoin, are always going to be brushing up against these things. And the success of Bitcoin and other digital forms of value I think will happen because I think there'll be a fundamental shift that we just won't necessarily have to accept a currency because we're born into it. We can start accepting currencies because we believe in them. And that's why we have Bitcoin 5,000 alternatives right now. Thank you.